A portion of this video is sponsored by Google. I think we're all familiar with the phrase, you eat with your eyes. It's a saying that immediately makes me think of an eyeball lined with rows of teeth, but then again, I make my living playing indie horror games, so my perception might be a bit skewed. In reality, though, it's a saying all about how when we're presented with food, the first thing that impacts our taste is the visual presentation. This looks a lot tastier than this. But just because it looks tastier, does that necessarily mean that it is tastier? Well, actually, a lot. Today, we're looking at how much sight lies to us about the food that we eat, with team theorists putting their tongues on the line for you and for science. And if sight truly is that important for flavor, have you ever considered how people with visual impairments taste the world around them? By the end of today's episode, you're not gonna believe your eyes or mouths. internet, welcome to Food Theory, the show that tastes as good as it looks. Previously on Food Theory, we did an episode all about how hearing has a big impact on how fresh we perceive something to be, that things that are crunchier or snappier tend to be rated as fresher, regardless of whether or not that's true. But that episode got me really thinking about our other senses too. When someone is told to taste a gross food, we tell them to hold their nose, because inherently we know that smell and taste are linked, and by holding your nose, the flavor is going to be lessened. But then, what about sight? Sure, Sure, we naturally have a preference for food that looks pretty, and high-end restaurants often justify their extreme prices by making the food on their plates into small works of art, but is that really affecting the flavor all that much? Can what you see with your eyes actually affect what you're tasting on your tongue? We decided to tackle the question in two ways. First, by doing a blind taste test with the help of team theorists involving some homemade gummy bears. I just want you to see this texture, okay? This gloopy... Augustus Gloop. Texture. Got that jiggle jiggle. Jiggle jiggle. They're wet. They are super duper wet. I am lucky to have a team that trusts me enough to eat my sketchy gummy bears. Listen, you work for Mr. Beast. You get money. You get candy factories. Premium made chocolate. You work for Theorist. You get boogers. You get goop. You done got gooped. Yeah, all right, I get it. I'm not a great cook. So that's test number one. Test number two then is looking at the real life data coming from individuals with visual impairments like congenital blindness. How do they taste the world around them? And how is their perception of food and flavor different from fully sighted individuals? Is there a difference? Spoiler alert, there is, and it's a big one. In fact, the results of both these explorations in today's episode will reveal some shocking truths about how sight may actually be preventing you from enjoying your next meal. It's just one example of how our senses shape the way that we understand and interact with the world around us, which is a big part of why it's important to ensure that those experiences are made accessible to everyone, including those with disabilities. Fortunately, technology can do a lot to ensure that everyone has the tools that they need to succeed. That's why I'm so excited to announce that my sponsor for this portion of today's episode is Google. Yeah, Google themselves. Pretty cool, right? So as you're well familiar with, I've been creating content on YouTube for over a decade now. Now. I'm the middle-aged dad of the platform. And for the last 10 years, one of the coolest parts of the job has been getting to meet with fans. This isn't just a channel and you aren't just viewers. This is a community of theorists, people united by their shared love of overthinking. And a huge part of that means making this channel more accessible so no one ever feels excluded. And that commitment translates in both big and small ways in everything that we do. Stuff like filling out the alternate text on any photo that we upload to social media, or writing our scripts in a way so that you never miss out on a joke just because you may have limited vision or are an audio only listener. Google actually feels the exact same way. They, like me, believe in the importance of accessibility. I mean, we are living in a digital age after all. There's no reason any physical limitation to our body should be holding us back. Well-designed technology can help everyone accomplish their goals. And Google has put that motto into practice by creating accessibility tools that everyone can use. For example, voice access was built from the ground up to help those who might not be able to physically use their phone. No one should be deprived deprived of the ability to flip between apps or type text just because of their physical limitations. And Google Voice Access grants that right to everyone by providing a hands-free way to use your phone with a few simple voice commands. It's also a tool that can be used by everyone. True story, you can actually type faster than I can using my fingers. It's also great to use while in the kitchen. Messy hands? Not a problem. It can read or write any email to me when I ask, or it can switch to any other app I might need, all without having to lift a finger. And it's something that you can get started with yourself. All you have to do 
is say, hey Google, voice access. There's also voice guidance, which was built with blind and low vision pedestrians in mind, allowing them to navigate streets confidently even though they might not be able to see the world around them. And again, even if you have perfect 2020 vision, it's a tool that proves invaluable to anyone. Having directions read to you in a clear, concise way, it just beats constantly having to stare at your phone for assistance. It's accessibility that improves lives for everyone. And I think we've all appreciated the live transcribe feature, whether we've realized it or not. Its primary purpose was for users with hearing impairments, so they wouldn't have to miss out on a phone call or one of my video's cringy puns. Now they could read all of that stuff in real time. You could say it's a t terrific tool. Like I said, terrible puns. Anyway, as a feature for everyone, I think we're all guilty of watching a video or two with the sound off while working and reading what's being said in the video instead of hearing it. Well, you've got yourself live transcribed to thank for that one. In short, a more accessible world means a better world for everyone. It matters to me and it matters to Google. So if you want to find out more about everything Google is working on to help make this world a more accessible place where everyone can feel like they belong, visit belonging.google. Or, you know the drill by now, check out the link right below the video. A big thanks to Google for all that they're doing to help make this world a more inclusive place and for sponsoring this portion of the video. Now back to how a lack of sight might just affect your taste. Dr. Charles Spence, professor of experimental psychology at Oxford University, put the relationship between taste and sight to the test by giving test subjects grape, orange, apple, and lemon beverages in clear glass bottles. All of the beverages were clear as well. Feels kind of like our Crystal Pepsi episode all over again. Since there was no coloring to give away the flavor, the test subjects actually had to guess based on flavor alone. And you know what? They did great. Despite the lack of colors, they were highly likely to guess the correct flavor within the drinks. But then he mixed it up. He added food coloring to mess with people's expectations, doing things like making the grape flavored drink orange. Suddenly, people would drink the orange colored beverage and report that it had an orange flavor. And here's the craziest part. This was true even after people were told that they had been messed with. Even when people knew that they were supposed to ignore the color, it didn't change the fact that simply seeing a yellow liquid in a bottle made them more likely to think that it tasted like lemonade. So, knowing this, I set out to do my own experiment with the help of several members of Team Theorist. Dan, Jerrica, Amy, and Casey were all brave enough to film themselves on camera. The things I do for my job, I'm fine. I was not coerced into doing this at all. This is not punishment for forgetting to do something. This is totally normal. Such a normal job. We also had a few extra volunteers. No, you can't have it. It's gone. Blech. The rest chose to remain anonymous. For the experiment, I created four batches of gummy bears to play with people's sense of taste. They are gummies formerly known as bears because as you can see, they are no longer a bear. They are a blob. They're a little melty because it's hot. I'm trying to hide my other disgust at basically what feels like eating little bundles of snot. All right, so some of them may have gotten a little bit malformed en route. California some are gonna do what California some are gonna do. Anyway, the four categories were as follows. One, clear gummies. Two, gummies that were colored to match their flavor. Three, gummies that were colored to not match their flavor. It's food theory. Hard mode. And four, a regular batch to eat blindfolded or using whatever eye shielding device they had in their vicinity, apparently. Hello and welcome to We Didn't Have a Blindfold in This House, so this is gonna have to do. High tech blindfold. Also, side note, man buns and head straps do not mix. For each batch, I cooked the same five flavors. It's also worth noting that I made sure that there was no smell for any of these guys, since again, smell can drastically affect your flavor perception. From there, I got our subjects to eat them and report for me whatever flavors they were tasting. Things that are usually creamy, but paired with strawberries? I'm gonna go with pear. Like, I like how that. you can pair your mouse with the subscribe button. That shameless plug is not gonna get you a bonus, Dan. Oh. Uh, oh. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. I mean, it didn't necessarily say that all the flavors were gonna be good. <laughs> What was that? <laughs> and the team, in true theorist form, are doing their best to try and outthink me and the test. Are we thinking that they have to be fruit? Because generally, candies are flavored as fruit in Except our brain. Except when they're chocolate. Except when they're chocolate. But are we predisposed in our brains to just kind of think that they're fruit flavors and Maybe. not like grass? Yeah, and so that's why I'm wondering if they're like, if they're trying to trick us into thinking that they are gonna be fruit flavored and then it ends up being some something actually cheesecake flavored, candle wax, something that's not normal flavors. It's moments like that that make me so proud of them. Anyway, once they were done guessing, I provided them an answer key to reveal the true flavors. Oh. 
Oh. We were so wrong on so many <laughs> levels. The first major surprise came with the clear gummies. I figured that clear gummies and the blindfolded test gummies would be pretty similar in result. After all, it's basically the same thing. No colors to either give you a hint or mislead you. But boy was I wrong. It turns out that seeing clear is actually a lot different from seeing nothing. When wearing a blindfold, everyone was able to reliably pick out the correct flavors. But when confronted with clear gummies, something about the color just made the taste experience different. Here's how the testers reacted when eating a clear gummy with a citrus fruit flavor. Is it water? Is <laughs> it taste water? Water with like a teaspoon of sugar. It tasted mostly just kind of like nothing. Li liquid. Everyone reported that the clear gummy tasted like nothing. And mind you, this is entirely due to the gummy's appearance. Lest you think it's something off about the flavor, here was their reaction later in the test when they were given the exact same flavor of gummy, but with red food coloring added. Blueberry? I get strawberry. Big strawberry vibes. Like, like orange Fanta. I hope this is, uh helpful. More helpful than you could imagine, head editor Dan. The clear gummy put people in the mindset of water or a lack of flavor, and that's exactly what they perceived, something tasteless. Whereas with a red gummy, suddenly they were getting hints of fruit, with both Casey and Dan making incorrect choices of strawberry and watermelon, classically red fruits to go along with the red coloring. Only Jerrica was able to correctly identify a tart citrus fruit to match the flavor that we had put in. I was prepared for the possibility that misleading colors might throw people off, but it hadn't even occurred to me that clear could do the same thing. But it turned out that this was true for almost all of the clear gummies. We were wrong. We were so, so wrong. And when it did come to those mismatched flavor to color gummies, the red herring effect was on full display. One of our gummies was pineapple. And when it was colored yellow, people nailed it. Pina colada. Pineapple? Banana. I got more like... Pineapple but when that same flavor was presented as a blue gummy, <laughs> the responses changed a lot. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, what do you got? I say like a sort of mouthwash again. I got mouthwash too. It okay. started as like blueberry. Blue Watermelon. raspberry. Again, all that changed here was the color. Everyone seemed to have the fix on pineapple when it was yellow, but by simply taking the pineapple flavor and coloring it blue, suddenly people's reactions tended toward things that you would associate with blue. Blueberry, blue raspberry, and of course, mouthwash, which I should mention was not one of the flavors included. I would never fudge science, but I would much rather be eating fudge than any of these. I'm glad I didn't fudge it up. Those were some of the notable examples that I wanted to pick out, but the overall data showed the exact same trend. People were at their most accurate when given colored gummies whose color was chosen to match the flavor, and they did almost as well when blindfolded. But when the gummies became clear, accuracy dropped considerably. And when the gummies were misleadingly colored, it led people to all sorts of wild conclusions. In total, 0% of those responses wound up being right. Are you saying I'm flavor blind? No, I'm saying that everything in the world is a lie and nothing is real. It's all a simulation. Do this we... is a simulation within the simulation. Still, all of this research to me felt incomplete because it was all coming from the premise that we have expectations about what food is supposed to look like. But all of that is based on the assumption that we were able to form those visual expectations in the first place. What happens when you do a blind taste test, not with sighted people who are blindfolded, but with people with congenital blindness, the people who have been blind since birth. Researchers at the University of Montreal School of Optometry did a study looking at exactly this, testing how vision affects the way that we eat and taste food. They came back with results that ranged from the expected to the absolutely shocking. First off, one thing they discovered is that sighted people tend to respond to external context to decide when and what to eat. Turns out that all that image-based advertising works on us. For sighted people, simply seeing food can put us in the mood to eat, regardless of how hungry we might actually be. People with congenital blindness, on the other hand, were more likely to rely on internal hunger and satiety clues. In other words, they were doing the impossible. They were basing their meal times on when they were actually hungry. Turns out that the method preferred by blind individuals is actually a lot better for their health, too. In fact, sighted people are more prone to maladaptive eating, which leads to eating disorders. In other words, all those external cues that sighted people so often respond to, like food ads, work in both directions. By making us eat when we're not hungry, but also by making us not eat when we should be. It would seem like eating too many snacks and skipping meals would 
would be opposite problems, but they actually both stem from the same fundamental problem, which is looking at the external environment and letting the things we see, including television ads and social media posts, dictate what and when we eat, rather than listening to our own body and letting those internal hunger cues decide when mealtime should be. But that wasn't even the most interesting part. One of their hypotheses was that people with congenital blindness would have a sharper sense of taste. After all, the conventional wisdom is that the less you rely on your vision, the more you have to rely on other senses. And research has shown that blind individuals have a more nuanced sense of hearing and touch. So the researchers thought the same would probably be true for taste as well. But in fact, it turned out to be the opposite. Their preliminary data suggested that blind people had a harder time when it came to tests involving taste detection and identification. So what gives? Is this yet another case of sight affecting what we taste, or was something else going on? The researchers wanted to understand why this discrepancy existed in the data, and they found that the blind individuals they studied had underexposed taste systems. In other words, blind people had less variety in their diet, and having a narrower palate made it harder for them to identify certain flavors. Now, of course, this answer wasn't that much of an answer, just left the researchers with a different question. Why the blind individuals they talked to had less variety in their food diet? One of the things they considered was food neophobia, that is, the fear of trying new foods. The researchers originally hypothesized that blind individuals would score higher on this test, and that hypothesis turned out to be 100% wrong. Instead, in defiance of their expectations, the researchers found there was no difference between sighted people and people with congenital blindness when it came to how willing they were to try new foods. The more they dug into the results, the more it became clear what the real story here was. The fact that blind individuals had less variety in their diet had nothing to do with their preferences, and it had everything to do with what researchers described as blindness-related obstacles when shopping for food, cooking, and eating out. It's not that blind people didn't want to try new food. It was that grocery stores and restaurants made it harder for them to try new foods by not accommodating their disability. When a restaurant doesn't offer menus in Braille, it's a lot easier to just say, I'll take a hamburger or some other familiar food that you know is going to be on the menu. By the way, restaurant owners, if you're looking for a way to get more business and make the world a more inclusive place, just saying, seemingly small things can make a big difference when it comes to accessibility. The good news is that's something we can take steps towards improving, changing the world so it's more inclusive for everyone. In the end, though, when it comes to taste, sight matters. Sight can mislead us, sight can make us hungry, sight can make us skip meals, it can make us taste things that aren't there and mistaste things that are there. In many ways, the ability to see is actually hampering our ability to truly taste. So the next time you sit down to a meal, try to eat with your mouth first instead of your eyes, because the truth is always a little bit sweeter. And remember, it's all just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit. Well, there you go. Science at its finest. Mmm. Science tastes squishy. Yeah, science tastes squishy. And hey, if you want to see me do a blindfolded taste test of my own, check out this video where I try to prove that different breakfast cereals are actually the same product with different colors. Or check out this video to watch Team Theorist endure another sweet tasting test where they have to lick their way to the chewy center of a hard candy pop. What's the weirdest thing you've had to do for my job? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Would it be caressing aggressively a Tootsie Pop with my tongue